one of the things that stood out to me about the book, Grateful, Eric Bischoff and Guy Evans, of course. Don't worry, I'll be putting the graphics on constantly. And you talk about Hulk Hogan a lot in the book. And something, it, it, I, feel, I feel actually quite bad, actually, because you're talking about, you know, after the divorce starts happening with Hulk Hogan, he's in a very, very bad place. And as someone just watching Hulk Hogan as an entity on TV, as a large and live superhero, it took me maybe a few pages to to maybe get the sympathy I should have had for Hogan because he's such a superhero that you sort of forget that he's a real person in that sense as well. But I mean, yeah. do you know what? I, yeah, I, I mean, take it from there, I suppose. Yeah, that's, that's you know, we all experience, anybody that's ever been a fairly high profile character in the wrestling business, you know, we all experience that in one way, shape or form. And because people have a hard time separating the character from the real person, you know, and, and it's different, you know, for movie stars, you know, when you meet Tom Cruise, you, you, you understand that he doesn't really know how to fly a fighter jet, right? He's five foot six, about 140 pounds. And he's not the guy that you see on mission impossible, but you, you can distinguish it because as culturally and growing up, you know, these are actors playing a role, but wrestling has always kind of blurred those lines, right? Wrestling characters, not so much as now, but in the past would always live their characters in public. That's where one of the things that kayfabe was about. You know, if you were a wrestler back in the seventies, even into the eighties, you know, if you were a wrestler and I'm a wrestler and you're the heel and I'm the baby face, if I walked into a restaurant and I saw you in that restaurant, I'd turn around and walk out. That's how you protected the business. And you, you, you kept the audience and the public in a constant state of not being sure if it's real or not. Being able to achieve that state of mind amongst the audience where, yeah, I know it's all entertainment, but these two guys really do hate each other. Like if you can get them to slip into that, that gray area of not knowing what's real and what's not real. That's the magic of professional wrestling. It's not unlike a professional magician. You know, when you go to a magic show, you know, this guy is not some wizard or some satanic creature or somebody from, you know, the heavens that's able to do magic. You know, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's a show, but you can't figure it out. And when magic is really good, you forget that it's a show. And you think that this guy is really creating magic. And that's the magic of professional wrestling. So as a result of that, and the way that manifests is hmm. people, you know, for, I'll use myself as an example. You know, I played an evil, arrogant, you know, just maniacal boss, manipulative boss, right? And people still have that perception of me to this day. That's what they grew up watching. You know, people watch, they, they know the Mr. McMahon character. Now, granted, you know, the Vince McMahon character and the Mr. McMahon character, while they're two different people, there are some parallels and similarities as there were with me, which makes it even harder for the audience to distinguish. But when you talk about Hulk Hogan, here's a guy who was at the top of the industry for so long. He was an icon. He changed the, he changed professional wrestling during his era to become much more mainstream on the cover of sports illustrated, you know, in movie, all all the things that back then in the eighties were mind boggling. You know, now we take it for granted. Rock's the highest paid movie star in the world. Now we take that for granted. But back then when Hogan did it first, not that he was the highest paid actor in the world ever, but he broke through that mainstream barrier where the, the, the mainstream media no longer looked at professional wrestling the same way they looked at porn because that's the way people felt about wrestling back in the day. Like sort of brown paper bag sort of thing. Yeah. You discuss yeah. It like, like that, you, you know, you'd watch it, but you wouldn't tell anybody you watched it. Right. You know, and if you did, it was like, Oh, I just, you know, it's like playboy. I only read it for the stories. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, but with Hulk, because he had been there for so long and jealousy, envy, resentment, you know, a lot of people that worked with Hulk over the years that didn't get the accolades that Hulk did or get the opportunities that Hulk did. That's where it all starts, right? There's always somebody willing to tear you down. 
And sometimes there were people that were the closest to you that you would least expect. And then you get the media narratives, you know, for whatever reason, a guy like Dave Meltzer just hated Hulk Hogan because he couldn't go out there and put on a five-star Japanese style match. He just hated the fact that Hulk Hogan was Hulk Hogan. And, and, and the peripheral media starts to create this negative narrative about a guy like Hulk Hogan. And before you know it, over the course of time, and in Hulk's case, 10, 15, 20, 30 years of that, all of a sudden there's a narrative about who Hulk Hogan is. And it's the farthest thing from the truth. Hulk Hogan is one of the kindest, most generous, and I'm not just talking about financially, although that too, but he cares about people, you know? And I saw that early on when I first met him and it, it became apparent to me with the little things. I always judge people by how they treat people that can't possibly benefit them. Right. If, if I see somebody, you know, being extra kind and cordial and you know, going out of their way to be a, a, a great person and great energy, but they're doing it with somebody that they're trying to get something from that says nothing to me about that person. Actually it does, but not really. But when I see somebody like Hulk Hogan, who in the middle of a meal, while he's engaged in an important conversation and somebody comes up to him and says, and I've heard this a million times, Hey Hulk, I hate to interrupt, but, and Hulk Hogan over the decades that I've worked with Hulk and been in private situations with him, public situations with him, I've never seen him do anything other than make that person feel good. That doesn't benefit Hulk Hogan, but he cares. And that's one of the things that impressed me most about Hulk Hogan is the way he treated people who couldn't benefit him in one, any way, shape, or form. But most people don't know that about him. Now, is he a flawed person? Has he made some really fucked up mistakes? Of course he has. So have I, so have you, and so does so has everybody that's so critical of him. You know, we don't want to look at our own lives and our own biases and our own mistakes and our own tendency to be judgmental or or whatever. You know, we all have flaws. And Hulk, in one of the most vulnerable times of his life, when he was physically in so much pain, he was being medicated like a horse. His doctors were giving him medication that would probably have killed most people. But that's how severe that pain was for him, his back issues. Oh, and let's add on top of that, that his, his wife was divorcing him. He was losing his wife. He was losing his home. He was losing his identity as Hulk Hogan. And he was self-medicating on top of the, the medication that he absolutely needed. By the way, I was there. I saw it. It sometimes brought tears to my eyes when I would see him struggle even to get in and out of a vehicle. It would take him 10 minutes just to get his legs out and, and be able to stand up so that he could walk to a meeting. Whew. People never saw that. And, and when you take all of that medication that he, it was necessary for him, and then he was self-medicating on top of that. He would sit down and go through a quart of vodka between four o'clock in the afternoon and eight o'clock at night on top of the medication. That, and, and yeah, in that period of time, He's, he, he had a lapse in judgment and said things that aren't a reflection of who Hulk Hogan is at all. They're a reflection of a broken, overly medicated, alcohol-fueled, desperate person at the lowest point in his life. And of all the critics that are, were so vociferous in their criticism of Hulk Hogan, I would like them to ask themselves, what they think they would be like in that situation. We've, man, but people don't know what he's really like. So, I mean, some do, some people do, and they love him for it. But, you know, the media narrative and the 
the dirt sheets and the Dave Meltzer's of the world have no idea what kind of person the CM Punk. It's one of the reasons I was so down on CM Punk when he made his comeback, because in his very first promo, he had to reach into his bag of cheap heat and try to get, get over by burying Hulk Hogan. By the way, a guy he's never worked with and has never met and doesn't know. I never outdrew. Let me tell you what, what, what kind of asshole are you and, and how little confidence in your own abilities do you have to have to, Try to get your heat and try to get over by burying someone you don't even know. One more point about the book with Hulk Hogan is you say that Hulk Hogan trusted, forget Hulk Hogan, Terry, trusted you so much uh, when he was going through the divorce, he put all his assets and all his money into your accounts and in your name to sort of save as much as he could uh, through divorce proceedings. Do you remember how much it was or is that just between you and Terry? No. And, you know, I, I did say that and, and it is true, um, but there's more to it than that. You know, I was working closely with Terry's financial advisor and lawyers as they were trying to structure um, Terry's finances in such a way that knowing that a divorce was coming to be able to protect as much of his assets as he could. And part of that was to create an LLC, which is a legal Organize, it's like an, a corporation of sorts that those assets would go into. And while Terry had majority, the majority of shares and stock in that, I had actual control over it. And a, a lot of that had more to do with his trademarks as much as it had to do with property and, and money. And the honest answer is I don't know um, because his finance team, his, his legal team and his accounting team were the ones that created that architecture. I was just, I had the ability. I mean, if I wanted to be a criminal, I could have, I could have entered into all kinds of licensing and trademark deals that would have benefited me. I could have probably, you know, liquidated assets, I guess, in some way, shape or form, but it was created to be a temporary situation and a bridge of sorts until Terry's legal situation with regard to his divorce was finalized. So it, it sounds like, you know, he put $20 million in my checking account or something like that. It wasn't quite like that. It was more complicated than that. But the, the element of trust was at the, at, at the nucleus of that. Terry needed to have somebody that he could trust and rely upon to help him facilitate some of the things that he needed to do. 